Hello. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Chris, and I am lead data engineer for the applied data science and machine learning team within Sainsbury's. And um, Sainsbury's, for those of you who don't know, is one of the biggest supermarkets in the UK. And as part of my day-to-day -day role, um, I take the work that my data science colleagues do, and I translate that into production systems. And what I mean by production systems are systems which the business relies on to function. So to give you an example, uh, is Sainsbury's does home deliveries. And as part of that, we have at least three algorithms that contribute. We have algorithms that tell us how best to put things onto the shelves. We have algorithms which tell us how best to get those things back off the shelves and into the right orders. And we have an algorithm which optimizes the number of vans and drivers that we should put into um, our workforce um, based on a series of business constraints. And you can see from those examples that if any of those uh, don't work, then Sainsbury's will not function as optimally as it should, and we could start to lose money. So um, when creating these systems, we have to make sure they're consistent and work every time. And we do that using test-driven development. And it's worth at this point mentioning that I didn't start out my journey um, as an engineer doing test-driven development. Um, when I first started out, I was taught how to write test plans. And test plans are the really fun exercise of writing a list of things such as, when I click this button, this thing will go into my basket. And I had to manually go through and tick that off the list. And I also worked in businesses that, where the thing that I was working on was considered such low value to the business. that They didn't want us to invest time in tests. They just wanted it out the door. Um, and then. As I matured as an engineer, mainly I thought that test driven development meant completing my work, finishing the code I'd written, and then introducing tests after the fact. And that's incredibly tedious. So it only changed for me when I joined the BBC. And I started working on BBC iPlayer, which is another UK only service that provides BBC video. And for me, um, we, I was part of moving this to the cloud. And as part of doing that, we had to build it as a production system. And we were on call. I was one of two people that were on call for this system. And that meant that when it went down, we had to explain what had gone wrong. And when we first did it, we just wanted to prove a point, And we wanted to get into the cloud as quickly as possible. So we just threw the code up there. And when it went down, we couldn't explain why. And you know, this is meant to be the future of BBC TV. So when it went down, the entire business was on red alert. And what that meant is that we had to very quickly change our approach. And we introduced test room development here because it meant that we would make our code um, much, much better tested but also improve code quality um, as we went along. And I think the main thing that really motivates me to continue using test driven development today is that I was called out for this before I left the BBC at half past two in the morning for a security incident. And the BBC takes security incidents very seriously. And being as the, I am not a morning person, I also took this incident very seriously. So what I realized is that it wasn't even our code that had broken the iPlayer website. It was another part of the organization who hadn't followed these practices, hadn't really tested the code at all, and put it into production, which meant that I had to be woken up at half past two. So when I was uh, initially taught TD, it was quite a tedious exercise. Um, and now the way I do it is slightly different um, in data science. So to help motivate that and return back to the world of data science, I took an example notebook. 
And the reason I use an example notebook is because it's something that I can share with you. Um, because some of the Sainsbury's algorithms are sort of intellectual property. And um, it's also very representative of how we might come to something in Sainsbury's. Because we do a lot of proof of concept work. And again, that work is to prove a point. Because the business isn't mature. Um, and as many large organizations, they're not mature in knowing what data science can do for them. So we often create notebooks um, to prove these things out, uh, which will then be put in a queue. Um, when we have data available, um, we have uh, more interest from stakeholders, and then it'll come back around to us. And in the case of this notebook, um, this particular notebook is a pretty good example of roughly the state that um, we get code in, because it's relatively clean. You know, we tidied it up, we put it on a shelf, and we come back to it. So, the first start of any data journey is with the data itself. So, in this data set, you can see on the left is a series of Pokemon, which are indexed by their unique identifier. And they have a series of attributes about them, um, whether it be types, um, battle statistics, which uh, attack, defense, uh, speed. And then they have some information about when they appeared, which generation they appeared in, and also whether they're legendary, which is just whether they're a little bit rarer than other Pokemon. So the second data frame is just pitting the, these Pokemon against each other. So in the first row, Pokemon 266 fights Pokemon 298 using those unique identifiers, and Pokemon 298 wins. And the purpose of this pipeline is to see whether we can predict those outcomes on unseen data. So quite a classic uh, data science problem. So how do we typically go about doing this in notebooks? We check it as we go along. And this is the kind of typical scenario that uh, I definitely do in my notebooks. Um, and just to look at the data and inspect it and make sure the transformations we've done make sense. And this is fairly typical of any exploratory work. Um, and this is the point where we shouldn't include tests, because we want the freedom to play around and wrangle the data and explore it um, in its entirety. So I think at this point, it's a good time to clarify exactly um, what I mean by test-driven development. And sort of show how um, it's, like it's more of an automated form of doing this exact thing. So test driven development in its simplest form is writing the smallest test that you can that shows that something fails. Um, and I've got an example test, which just tests the right columns up here based on um, the Pokemon we saw, the combats we saw, and then a uh, collected CSV file of what I expect to see. And clearly this fails because um, the function itself is just passing, which means it returns nothing. And this is good for a number of reasons. Um, by doing this process first, you know your test fails. And that means that you can rely on when the test passes that you've actually implemented what you wanted to implement. And um, one of the things that I've seen a lot when we do after the fact tests is not only are they tedious and boring, but then someone can come along and delete a lot of code. And even though we've got 100% test coverage, then that, the tests will still pass. And that's because they didn't check the test would actually fail first. So once we've got a failing test, the next step is to make it pass. And in this case, um, to make it pass quickly and easily, um, I just copied the code from the notebook because in sort of, it's very easy to be sort of a purist and, and figure out the, the sort of intricacies of building this up step by step, but we've done this in the notebook. We've done that exploration. So we can just take some example code, throw it in, and make it pass. And um, once we've done this and we've got some passing tests, this is the great um, reward of making tests pass, is that we're then allowed to go back and refactor it 
And what refactoring means is just to go through and make it cleaner and nicer. And if we don't ever have this safety net of a passing test, then it's really difficult to refactor because we have these huge, huge um, functions that we put together and we're not really sure what parts of it are useful. And if we don't make the test fail first, then we're not even sure or confident that our tests will cover um, our refactoring. And uh, it, you can save this step. Um, so usually um, the process looks more like red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green. And then a bit of refactoring at the end um, because you can look at the software architecture as it grows. And this is one of the things that's not entirely clear when you see that red, green refactor loop. So let's head back to our notebook and let's have a look at breaking it down. And as I say, I'm going to write the smallest possible test to make this pass. And in this case, the smallest possible test for an entire notebook is quite large. So I started writing it and realized that I had to implement this extract features function. And this is where sort of the sensibilities of writing code come in. And I realized that maybe I should have a look at this feature pipeline first to see whether um, I could test the entire thing as part of this larger pipeline test. So this is the top of the feature transformation section of the notebook. And as you can see, it's quite a lot. And there's more to it further down. But we're going to stick with this part of it for the majority of the talk. And if we look at it, we recognize that this is quite a large chunk to test in itself. And this is the test driving and sort of making you figure out the smallest possible chunk as you go down. And this is very similar to what we did when we built iPlayer. Um, because we wrote tests that said, hey, I would like a home page. And then we'd write an inner test. We said, hey, I would quite like to have a row on that home page. And then we write an inner test. We said, hey, I'd quite like to have like an individual item in that row. And we drill down until the sensible size of a test um, based on our knowledge and expertise. And this is where um, you know, test driven development isn't this rigorous practice of having to write tests for everything. It's about breaking down problems and letting tests drive. So I created this um, test, which shows um, a different approach to creating some sample data, which is using dataframe.head on the combats. Um, so I'm only looking at five rows now, because that was enough to sort of create a test to wrap around the whole thing. And I ran that through the um, method in the notebook and sort of took out um, the result and stored that as a CSV to make sure that my version of it was reflective of the version that was in the notebook. And again, because we got all that stuff that we did in the notebook, we can do these um, quick and easy tests and generate um, that drill down. But as I said, this is quite a meaty function to test entirely. And we could just test it with um, running the whole thing but sensibly, we can break it down. And to do this, I just, because I've approached this uh, notebook as I usually approach my work in Sainsbury's, I might not have um, as much context as I need to do this right the first time round. So I'm just gonna have a go. And also, um, it's worth noting that if you've put something on the shelf for six months and the business suddenly comes and asks for it, then even the people who worked on it originally might not quite remember. So I went down and I sort of highlighted this first bit. And I said, this adds extra columns, which all the other functions also add extra columns. But for me, you know, the next one had some Lambda functions and then there was some more transformations. So I thought, let's start by breaking it down this way, going line by line. And what that looked like in terms of dragging out that data was literally doing this and creating that CSV file by running the function and sort of stealing the output halfway through. 
And again, it's just a quick and easy way to create test data. And once I'd stolen this uh, CSV file from the middle of the function, then I can ensure that the exact same output is coming from what we already analyzed and worked on in that notebook. So we ended up with a test like this, which again, I pass in combats and Pokemon, and I get back out uh, that expected data frame at the bottom. And you can see it's doing exactly what it says on the tin. This is combat, as we saw it last time. And here are some additional columns. So as promised, it does actually add columns. And uh, as I said, I just copied it from the notebook. So again, taking this top section. And then the next thing is that I looked at the, the next set of lines and broke those down. And I have these type advantage columns that I need to do some transformations on. So again, same process, red, green, red, green, going round. And at this point, I've not really refactored much because um, I just wanted to build up a set of tests that were fairly representative. And as I say, sometimes you can save that refactoring until the software architecture sort of reveals itself rather than designing it up front. So I ended up with tests like this. And what these tests do is show some um, interesting uh, like things that I did to steal the CSV files. So first of all, in this example, the entry point for this function uses the pre-processed data from that previous function that I've already saved as a fixture. So storing out and reusing those fixtures is really important, um, especially if you're going to do pipeline testing. You can stitch them together um, across multiple stages in the pipeline and make sure that they feed into each other effectively. And then the other one is that I realized with the win columns that this didn't really represent um, the data set very well with only five rows from that head. So I did it with 1,000 instead. And again, it's just uh, quick and easy. But um, the, because it aggregated across the data frame, it made a lot more sense. And then finally. The most important part is that I had all these little functions that looked a bit like this. And this is the fun bit for me with test and development, is that because I've broken it down, I now have a very simple function which has um, a very small um, lines of code sort of count. And it, each function individually describes what it does. But as with uh, a lot of testing, it didn't quite pass. Um, and the reason for that is because I've been avoiding um, some of the code in the notebook. But this is a really good example of where test and development saved me because of using that data that I cheekily took from the notebook. Because now I can tell that it's not doing the exact same thing. And I have a test that will confirm that for me. So, the example um, notebook had this amazing piece of code, um, which removes the columns down to just those ones that are important. And I didn't really like this code, because I think that I can do, a, do this in the individual functions. And um, what I did is I went back to our good feature pipeline. And using my knowledge that I've just got from breaking it down once, I can break it down again. So the bit that I thought was additional columns, I could actually look at in isolation and realize there were just a few bits that were to do with the attack on the Pokemon. And then I could look at my type advantage, and I could realize that it had a friend at the top of the function, which I'd missed in my first go around. And then also, this slither here was to do with some stuff way down in the function. Um, but I hadn't connected them together yet. So by going through this iterative reanalysis, I managed to break it down in a different way, which allowed me to focus on getting the right columns out. And this is one of the things that I can now do because I have a complete test suite that's green, is I can go back and I can change one function in isolation and slowly, using those example data sets, go back and uh, change the behavior of one thing in isolation without breaking anything else 
And that's the power of a really good test suite. And by going through these things, I ended up um, with code that looked like this, which um, I sort of showed a similar example at the beginning, where the data frames now don't bleed out. They're just constructed within the function. And um, then all the transformations do is add the smallest possible count out of that function. And I show this example for one particular reason, is that it has these little helper functions. And I didn't write any tests for these, because that's tedious. And I didn't want to, because they represent the logic of this wider function. And this is one of the things that sort of, when you're taught rigorous TDD, you probably have to write tests for these things, even though they're one-liners, um, very simple. Um, but I believe in just testing the business logic and testing the data. So these were left as a tested by side effect. And then what we ended up with, uh, these data frames that I had originally shrank down to really easily manageable data frames that I could inspect um, in a notebook or in Excel or wherever I happened to be looking at it. And the, that was really useful as well to diagnose exactly what was going through this pipeline. And then the amazing part about this is that once I'd done that second round of iterating and going through the tests, the test passed. And this is the best bit for me, is when a series of smaller tests actually add up and do what they're supposed to do. Because this means that I did recreate exactly what my data science colleagues passed across to me. And the, our code in production is now broken down, tested, and fairly deterministic. So that was a big win. But I was missing a fairly large chunk of this pipeline. And at this point, I kind of written quite a lot of code. And usually, when we're doing transfer of knowledge, we pair as a data scientist and an engineer, because you know, they'll understand it a lot more than I will to start off with. In this case, for this example, I wrote this test for my partner. So I just went into the notebook, and it said the accuracy is 96%. So I wrote a test that said it should be higher than 95, because that seems reasonable. And if I change the model at all, that would probably be a pretty good value to go for. And this is a good example of where, in a sort of randomish environment, you can set a load of parameters for your model. and you can ensure that you hit all those targets that you've predefined, whether it be precision, recall, F1 score, um, or anything else. Unfortunately, my partner is a very seasoned software engineer and knows this game very well. So she decided that instead of implementing the model, she would play the test driven development game, which is to write the smallest amount of code possible. And it turns out, um, for this model, it's a little bit less code to just return the fixture than it is to actually implement the model. And I think it, this is a, a good example of how like, test-driven development can become a really fun game and how I use it a lot in my team. Um, because you can introduce this idea of someone else writing the code and they don't have to necessarily get it right. Um, but they can, you can just build up their knowledge and understanding as you go, which is a fun teaching tool. But if you're pairing, it also becomes a game of ping pong. Because my partner then did this and said, hey, if you want your model to output those predictions that you got from that notebook, then you should probably test that your model outputs those predictions that you got from that notebook. And in this case, I could have been like mean, I could have returned the predictions. But for the sake of this talk, um, I'm going to opt um, to instead just implement it. Um, because this game, uh, we can go down into multiple cycles for a long, long time. Because we could have added all those tests for precision, for recall, um, for anything else you wanted to force that particular model to emerge, which is quite fun. Um, 
And in a production environment, I encourage this heavily, like actually going backwards and forwards. It can take seconds to go through each iteration at that point. But the importance for this talk is to look at um, this particular model um, with the things that we had to do to make it deterministic. So one of the things here is taking from the notebook and fixing the random state. Um, because if it's you know a random forest, then it will sort of change its values slightly um, depending on where it starts. So then the predictions would change each time. And the, we wanted them to definitely, definitely be this model. So in that case, um, what we created is this snapshot of an output of one particular model. And what's good about this is that you can actually use that um, to look at changes in your model over time. Because if you update SK Learn and you run these tests again, you might get a different model, even though it's the same stuff. And it'll give you an example of how that has changed. And you can use that snapshot to tell you um, all about what the new characteristics are of that model. And in a world where we talk a lot about reproducibility and explainability, this is very important to us. So just as we near the end of this, I want to talk about the final journey to production. And I, I mentioned sort of the um, more pure form of test driven development that you know, I got taught as a software engineer. And one of the things we encounter in production is definitely bad data. And a lot of the time, that comes in the way of empty data frames. So if you're taught this rigorously, you'll start with an empty data frame. But it's just important to be aware of it when you're putting systems into production. And then the second thing is that in production, we have bad data. And I don't think that comes as any surprise. But the way we dealt with data issues and bugs in general is that because we have that example, again, we take it, we run it through, and then we make sure that whatever we get out the other side isn't broken. And then we can use test driven development to allow us to ensure that we fix the bug. Because we can see that failing from the bug straight away in our red phase. So, so as a quick closing summary, um, TDD shouldn't be um, really burdensome, especially in data science where we've done so much work in our notebooks up front. Um, we can use it as a way to teach and collaborate with others. Um, and also, it's a really useful production tool um, to help you get code that's clean and easily readable, so I know what's going on in production. But also, if you get a bug, it can be really helpful in just allowing the framework to track it down. So thank you for sitting through this talk. Um, and here are some QR codes that can hopefully um, reward you a little bit for that. But also, um, there's a picture of me looking very triumphant um, because one of my personal goals is to come out and do more public speaking like this. And Sainsbury's has given me the sort of freedom and the resources to allow me to come here and talk to you. So thank you so very much. Thank you.